Welcome to Crash Concepts, where the economy, energy, and the environment are explored. Up next, fresh ideas and insights into the factors that are driving the world and shaping your future. Presenting information you can't afford to live without, here's Chris Martinson. Welcome, everybody, to this Peak Prosperity Podcast. I'm your host, Chris Martinson, and it is Wednesday, May 23rd, 2018. And today, we are going to be talking about energy again. Why? Because energy is everything. You know my view. If you've been following me, you know I think there is an oil price shock coming because I think there's an oil supply problem in the future. And today, we are going to be talking with one of the leading experts on oil and gas production in the U.S., one of my favorite guests, a person I really trust a lot and I like as well. And here's why you should, you personally should care a lot about this subject. Listen, there's simply no question that economic growth requires energy. Maybe you've heard about how the U.S. economy is decoupling from energy and all that, and it's pure bunk. If you chart, and this is one of the best charts I have, very robust chart, uh, because the line is so linear. If you chart world economic growth and you chart world energy consumption, why world? Because If the United States is exporting its energy use to another country and then importing the finished product, then pretending it's energy decoupling, it hides the truth of the nature of the matter, which is this. World energy consumption has been going up steadily for a very long time. So is the world economy. And if you want one more unit of economy, you're going to have another unit of energy consumption, whatever those units are. So it matters. And here's the thing. We are in a world awash with debt right now, $233 of actual debt probably five times that amount of unfunded liabilities, call them IOUs, put it together. It's just an astonishing pile. So the whole world, including seven and a half billion people, are all counting on us having more energy in the future. So maybe we should take a close look at that. So that's what we're going to do today. We're welcoming back to the program Art Berman. Let me introduce him. Art is an is a geological consultant with nearly 40 years of experience in petroleum exploration and production, 20 of those at Amoco, now known as BP. He's published more than 100 articles on geology, technology, and the petroleum industry during the past five years. Hey, he's got the chops. He's published in more than 20 articles and reports on shale gas plays. That's important in the U.S., including the Barnett, Haynesville, Fayetteville, Marcellus, Bakken, and Eagleford shales. I follow him really closely at his blog, at artberman.com and on Twitter, which is at A.E. Berman 12, A.E. Berman 1 2. Hey, you should follow him too. Art, welcome to the program. Thanks, Chris. Great to be here. Well, let, let, let's start here. I, I put a little something incendiary up front. I, I, I said, I think there's an oil price shock coming, and, and I base that on the idea that the last four years, 2014, 15, 16, 17, were really horrible years in terms of oil and gas discovery. Why? Because there were not, the spending collapsed in, in terms of uh, uh, the FIDs, uh, the, the uh, upstream oil and gas uh, exploration budgets just got, just got slashed at all the big companies. So I'm of this view that you have to find it before you can pump it. The oil and gas industry has a lag from finding to to being able to get it to market. It's a pretty long lag, five to seven years, depending on where we're at sort of on average. And I so I think that the lack of fines translates into a lack of supply. And I see that the IEA now agrees with that view and some other um, uh, houses are coming forward and saying uh, that they agree with that view too, possibly. What's your take on that? Yeah, it's just, it's, it's, a, it's a fact of nature. I mean, you, you, can't, you can't dispute it back before the price collapse, um, uh, you know, forget about the the slash budgets. The 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 size uh, of the fields that was being discovered was getting smaller and smaller, and and so basically, uh, the world has not been replacing what it uses since probably sometime back in the 1980s. So if you think about our energy supply as, as a savings account, um, you know, we've been, we've been hitting our savings to pay the bills, you know, transfer it to checking now for pretty nearly 40 years. And at some point, uh, you know, you get a notice from the bank that says, hey, guys, um, the savings account's getting really, really low. Uh, pretty soon it's going to be gone. You better put something in it. And so my, my point is that, before we stopped investing, we were having a real hard time uh, keeping money account and an awful 
happened in there. Kind of phony. Um, you know, a lot of it in the late 2000s, early two, or the late, uh, yeah, late 2000s, early 2000s, 20, 20, was uh, it was liquefied natural gas. It was it was stuff that was discovered a long time ago, but uh, was only allowed to be added as a reserve once we had the contract. So, you know, late 1990s and the beginning of of, of this century, uh, that was mostly what was being added. We ran out of that. And that's when companies like Exxon and Chevron and the like went into into the tight oil plays and the shale gas because they they just they just knew uh, we got to replace reserves and even if it's even if it's funny money which in some ways this is uh, that's what they did so 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 that that's where we were before we stopped spending on exploration and production so. We've had pretty much four years of no money spent, and and I need, I want to stress that you know exploration is important, and that's what you're talking about finding new stuff. But production, I mean, we have not been spending money to develop discovered, proved reserves in fields, and and we got you know BP, uh, their CEO just recently said, you know, we think that oil prices are ultimately going to be low, much lower than the public thinks. So we're not spending a dime on that now either. That's tough. It's, it's really, it's, it's really a problem. So if, if, uh, if they're not spending money on, on either exploration or infill drilling and the other pieces to, to boost production in existing fields, I assume that's because economically they say this isn't a worthwhile activity to do right now. And by the way, if you look at the return on capital for all the major world's oil companies, the, the Seven Sisters, it's abysmal. I mean, we're talking like grocery store sort of returns the last couple of years, 4%, 3 2 minus, negative, you know, negative 1%. Um, are, th th this, this is formerly like the biggest cash flow industry that you could possibly get involved in. Widows and orphans would want to buy this stock and get the dividends. And of course, they've kept the dividends up, but they've had to do that by taking on massive amounts of debt um, I mean, is that it, it, it? What's the other way to spin this? Because I look at this and I say, "Wow, that that's really that's a really unpleasant scenario for these companies to be in." And they and the way they've survived is by slashing their money spent on on exploration and uh, development. So, uh, tell wh 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 how long do you think before we start to feel that in the marketplace? I think we're feeling it right now, Chris. Uh, you know, we're we're. Uh... The price of oil has, you know, gone up like, uh, you know, 30 or, or more percent just here in the last year. And some of that, in fact, a lot of that is, is you know, there's some very good reasons. And, and so in the United States, we've been drawing down our, our, our reserves, our inventory, the, the amount of oil we have in storage um, consistently since February of 2017. So we're, you know, going into the 15th month of almost every week taking oil out of what we've got in storage because we're not producing enough to meet the need. And, and of course, anybody that pays attention, and I don't know that, you know, how many people do, but some do, to, you know, what, what goes on on a, you know, even a monthly basis in the oil industry. I mean, the United States is right now producing more oil than it ever has in its history. I mean, we're a million barrels a day higher than that peak in 1970 that, you know, King Hubbard and other people uh, got in trouble for saying what happened. So we're, you know, we're going up, you know, just for round numbers, you know, like 50,000 or so barrels per month of production and yet we're still sucking uh, oil out of storage. So what's that tell you? I mean, there's only one way to interpret that, and that is we're, you know, we're, we're using more than we're producing. Um, so if, if we're producing more than we ever have, what does that say about our supply? Now, that's the United States. That's not the world, but we are the biggest consumer of oil by far in the world. And for better or for worse, the United States has the best data. Uh, so, you know, we want to extrapolate to the rest of the world, uh, the rest of the developed world, the so-called OECD. We got pretty good data, not nearly as good uh, through the International Energy Agency. And beyond that, we got no idea. We're guessing, 
completely, particularly about the developing world. And that's where, you know, something like 80% of the demand growth is coming from. And so, you know, we got a big question mark, but I'm saying uh, I can't give you a number, but I'll fill in the question mark for you and tell me, tell you we're in deep trouble. Um, we, you know, because I mean, countries like the United States and Western Europe, I mean, our demand is pretty much stable. You know, I mean, we're not we're not a big growing economy anymore. Uh, these emerging markets, uh, Asia, you know, Latin America, Africa, they're going full bore. So. Uh, I think that we're, you know, we've seen oil. I mean, Brent has been up to $80 uh, here recently. WTI, the U.S. domestic oil, is up over 70 Even on a bad news day like mm -hmm. today, it's still $71. There's only one explanation for that, and that is that supply is perceived as tight. Whether it actually is or not, I just told you it is, but, you know, perception's part of it. So, I think we're, you know, we're kind of in trouble for supply right now. That's the answer. And and that's what we're seeing in the in the price data. And of course, oil is a really inelastic substance, meaning uh, that uh, the the price is going to move uh, pretty pretty aggressively, um, depending on whether you have supply and where the supply and demand is. So the story through 2017 was, hey, we're, the world's awash in oil. I have these Forbes headlines even as recently as a month ago saying that the United States has to avoid the abundance trap. Like, so we have that that neat theme, but um, the rest of the data is starting to say, as best as, as we have it, says supply is now being exceeded by demand. And so we're starting to draw down on not just the U.S. reserves, but I've seen OECD data that says their uh, reserves are coming down you know, as much as you can trust all that data. But uh, the price it clearly says um, that supply is tighter than it used to be. And so the price went up. Is is that too simplistic? No. And, and I mean, I, I wrote a post probably six months ago. And the title was something like, uh, you know, the U.S. oil oversupply it has ended. Uh, and, and it took me a while to you know, gather the data and then the courage to, to you know, to publish that. But, hmm. um, you know, so I, 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 I waited longer than when I thought that was happening. Uh, so it's ironic that, you know, you've got somebody weird like me saying that maybe I think it was in November. And here we got Forbes, who I sometimes write for, by the way, um, you know, just here in the last month or so saying, oh, no, no, we got too much oil. Well, you know, I, we, we can't both be right. And, uh, I, I, you know, I don't know what data they're using, but I, I'll show you what I've been using. And, and, you know, I, it's not a matter of, uh, pride of ownership. It's just that there's certain things that you can't be wrong about. And, and, and for now, I mean, I know I'm not wrong about that. Well, that, that's fascinating. So, um, it, Talk to us about uh, about this uh, first. I just love to dispel these myths because they're so deeply ingrained, and I run into these all the time in in front of audiences. Uh, one is that the United States is now uh, a net energy exporter, meaning totally bogus, totally bogus. So I mean, just there's there's no statistical sleight of hand that can be used to make that a true statement. Now, is the United States is our, our net our net import or net export, whichever you want to do it, of you know crude oil and petroleum products, has it gone down a lot over the last 10 years? Absolutely yes, it absolutely has. Uh, is it anywhere close to zero? It's nowhere close to zero. And I, I hesitate to say never, but it is extremely unlikely that it will ever be never. Now, uh, Michael Levy, who is uh, uh, an energy analyst who I, I kind of like, he made a great analogy a couple of years ago. He said, regarding this exact point, that if a country like the United States imports millions of cars, let's say from Italy, paints them green, and then sends them overseas to be sold, is the United States a net exporter of green cars? Hmm. Well, depends on the sleight of hand you use. I mean, you can make the, the statistical argument, but the fact is all we did was put paint 
<laughs> on cars that were made somewhere else. And that's the deal with this whole net exporter thing is uh, never, ever lose sight of the fact that the United States imports a ton of oil. I mean, we're, we're importing on average 7 million barrels of crude oil a day. I mean, that's more than con many continents use a day. Why are we importing all that when we're also producing 11 million barrels a day? Because we're a factory. And, and that's a good thing, I think, for, you know, for the economic machine. We import a ton of crude oil so we can put it into our refineries along with our own oil, turn it around, add value, and make a profit by selling gasoline and diesel and God knows what else overseas. That's, that's a business model that works. But it's not our oil. It's, it's those Italian cars that we're painting green. You know, it's somebody else's oil that we're running through our refineries, making into diesel and, and gasoline and turning around and shipping back overseas. So be careful about that. Again, I, I don't want to diminish the fact that, you know, if you net it all out, um, we are we have improved considerably, but we're nowhere near energy self-sufficiency, nor do I think we'll ever get there. And to get there, of course, we would need another 4 million barrels a day just, just to, uh, 4 or 5, somewhere in that zone, just to get to zero uh, in, terms of, in terms of oil imports at, at this point in time. And, uh, you know, so I'm looking now at, at a Goldman Sachs top projects uh, report that you sent to me here, and it's a really good report. I think I'm going to make it available to people uh, who are listening to this by a link. Um, and they have a few things on here that, that really caught my eye. Um, and the first is that, uh, speaking back to the thing we already talked about, they say, so they're talking here about um, the amount of oil that's already been taken out of expected production by 2025, owing to, quote, delays in the FIDs, those are the, the first uh, investment decisions that the FIDs, um, since 2014. So they're saying that six, approximately 6 million barrels a day is missing from this equation. Um, as well, what we know is that uh, that the decline rates for existing fields is is very very high. So there's a probably you know this is there's a lot of hand waving around this number, but somewhere around four or five million barrels per day per year has to be replaced because of uh, depletion and decline rates from existing fields. So when we put all of that together, our you know I, I, it looks like um, this Goldman review is saying yeah we're missing a lot of oil. Where does that amount of oil come from in this story? Because you said yeah shale's throwing on fifty thousand barrels per day per month that's fine, but I carry that forward and I'm um, we're adding what I'll be generous a million barrels per day, two let's be real generous two. Where do you, where do you find uh, this this uh, missing six plus the other four or five that's missing every year? Where does that come from? Uh, well, that's the secret ingredient, isn't it? And the answer <laughs> is, uh, you can be optimistic and, and, you know, you can add up all the, you know, all the, the planned and probable projects that are out there. And if you assume that all of those things happen on time and, and that they actually meet the expectation that's been provided, and here's the big one, that there are no unplanned interruptions in supply, you can make a case that says, oh, you know, don't worry. But the, the, the reality is, is that those projects uh, never go according to plan. They always have problems. And more importantly, or as importantly, there, you know, we live in a world full of, 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 of unrest and chaos and war and uh, all sorts of bad things, and just as soon as you think we're, you know, we're on track for something working right for a change, you know, we end up with a with a Libya, you know, a big civil war that's still going on. And here's a country that, you know, was was producing a million and a half barrels a day consistently. And there have been times over the last, well, since 2011, when all that really got started, where they've produced zero. And even in a in a good day or a good week. Uh, you know, if they're up to half a million barrels a day, that's that's you know that's cause for celebration. So so there's a negative million right there in Libya. I mean, you know, I don't want to read a you know a, a, a litany of lists, but you know everybody just about knows that Venezuela is is in very very serious uh, political economic trouble, and their production 
is you know going down and down and down and that situ I, I don't see where there's a resolution and ironically the United States is making it worse by putting sanctions on them because we don't like their politics and I don't want to get into that and we're putting sanctions on Iran which is you know one of the biggest oil producers in the world and so you know it's it's a it's a whack-a-mole deal there's there's always a problem I mean even in a stable country like Canada you know they got a big you know they end up with a big forest fire up in you know the oil sands area which has nothing to do with oil production and suddenly we get a big interruption okay they fix that and then they have a problem with their Keystone not Keystone XL pipeline and for two months you know that's operating at 80 percent capacity and so there's always some problem the world doesn't work perfectly and so uh, you know I, I don't want to be pessimistic because I'm not but but eventually you know we have to learn some calibration and the calibration of history tells us you know don't count on 100 percent and certainly don't count on 120 percent if you count on 80 percent uh you might be closer to right and even then you'll be disappointed so th that that's the reality so we we simply cannot expect uh to take all the best case scenarios and imagine they're going to work out and, and let's talk about some of that best case coming back to the U.S., where, of course, the story is about the shale plays and, and just how extraordinary they are. Uh, Art, let's set aside shale gas for a minute, because I want to talk about that in a second. But just the oil and the near oil, which would be the Eagle Ferd, and it's, it's most, you know, heavy natural gas liquids. But let's call it oil for the moment. The shale oil story is that... Uh, this can just grow for a very, very long time. The Energy Information uh, Administration in the United States, the EIA, says, hey, this might peak somewhere around 2022, 2025, but then at just very slow tail out to 2050. Um, if, do you agree with those particular assessments, and, and do you have a view on when uh, we will see a peak in the shale oil plays? Right, Chris. Well, I, you know, I, I don't know what kind of drugs they've got over at the <laughs> Energy Information Administration. <laughs> yeah, I want them. I, I want them badly, <laughs> whatever they are. Um, you know, I, I, I put out some some slides uh, just here in the last couple of weeks where where I took the, you know, the the Department of Energy, the EIA. Uh, I took their proved reserve numbers for the the Eagle Ford and the Bakken and I said okay I'm gonna believe those because they've been kind of stable for a while and then I took the you know the 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 charts and the data behind them that they've put out for those you know those long-term production forecasts and I just said okay let's accumulate this stuff and what I found was that for the Bakken and the and the, and the Eagle Ford that at, the, at present production rates we run out of all those proved reserves in the next five years. And yet the EIA shows them producing like gangbusters, you know, out into 2040, 2045, yep. and then barely declining out to 2050, which is when their projection ends. Okay, well, that doesn't really make sense to me. Um, you know, okay, fine. The you know reserves are kind of fluid. You know, they're they're based on a price, and if price goes up, then you get more reserves. But but I look at their I look at their their price assumptions, and 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 most of the price increase that they show in their model happens between now and when we run out of all the proved reserves we book. So you know, what's the economic incentive for companies to go out and find new reserves if the price is flat? So that's that's the Eagle Ford and the Bakken. And before I go on, um, I've studied both of those. The Eagle Ford has declined a million barrels a day, and uh, you know I, I hate to make make predictions that I'll be wrong about, but I'll make a prediction that I don't think I'm going to be wrong about, which is I don't think it's coming back. Really? Yeah. And, and I've ta I've talked to. CEOs of, of companies that are in the Eagle Ford and they say geez you know we're you're right and I mean if you don't believe Art Berman I mean Tudor Pickering and Holt just put out a report this month on the Eagle Ford and they're saying the same thing that I am um, on the Bakken a year ago we talked about this when in one of our last conversations right. I said the Bakken's peaked you know it, it, it may come up again uh, close to what it did well you know, it hasn't even worked. It's declined every month in, in 2018. So let's get to the big kahuna. Let's get to the Permian Basin. 
Mm-hmm. Permian Basin, EIA has always underestimated the reserves, so I did it myself. I just added up all the numbers that companies list in their annual reports and then did a, you know, a conscientious extrapolation between the 50% of production those guys represent and the additional, the other 50. And I came up with 6 billion barrels. Okay, 6 billion barrels is, is a lot of oil. Um, run it through the same scenario, and what you find is that we, we run out of that 6 billion barrels in about 2025, uh, that's assuming production rates don't increase, and they're increasing all the time. And then the EIA's got another 40 billion barrels coming from where? Um, you know, from I, I guess I, I guess the same place that banks come up with money from. <laughs> uh, you know, and, and and you know, let's be fair. I mean, the the world has always lived on you know like a 10 year yeah. cushion between reserves and production. And in the past, when we could still go out and discover 20, 30, 40 billion barrel fields with some frequency, we never, we never actually got to the end of that road. Uh, I don't see where it's coming from now. So, you know, that's, a, that's kind of a, a long or comprehensive answer. But my take is if you're counting on U.S. shale oil to carry the U.S., much less the world, I say you're in big trouble by about 2025. Well, let's talk about some of that trouble, and and I'm not asking you to necessarily comment on the auto industry, but it really struck me that, you know, Ford Motor Company must have must have been looking at this data, and they came up with this idea, and they said, yeah, you know what, let's just scrap the sedans in the United States, small cars. We're going to just exclusively focus on SUVs and pickups, and of course, that's where they make their money, but but they must have known what happened to SUV and truck sales in 2008 when oil spiked. So, so here's a major company with presumably a lot of very good talent and strategic thinking people who looked at all of this same data, Art, and came to a very different conclusion than the, than the one you just drew. What's Do you think, did they just fall for a bad narrative, or, or is there another way to look at this that, that um, I have to go find? Hmm. Well... <laughs> You know, I, as, I've, as I've told you before, I, I'm a geologist and not an abnormal psychologist, <laughs> uh, although I do think about human behavior and, and, and why we do what we do. But, I, you know, I can't possibly explain to you um, a decision like that. But, you know, let's, let, let's go back to what I was talking about before. I mean, the EIA is not made up of a bunch of dummies. I mean, I have great respect for the people who work there and yet I mean this is group think um, it's a uh, it's a case of uh, you know since I since since I heard what you said and I agree with it and I tell the guy in the next office you know that I heard it from Chris and and I think the same thing you know eventually it comes back to Chris and you know and he hears from somebody he doesn't know um, that they think what he thinks and we all decide we're holding hands in a circle we must all be right well, mm-hmm. did anybody do the work? I, I don't know. I, I just, you know, I can't answer that question. All I can tell you, Chris, is I do the work. You know, I crunch the numbers. I don't sell anything other than, you know, my, my, my services as a geologist. So I don't have anything to gain from, you know, I'm not selling stock. I'm not, you know, I'm not doing anything like that. Uh, if I come up with, a, with a, a, an optimistic conclusion, I publish it. If I come up with a negative one, I publish it because the only thing that I sell is me and my integrity. So I don't, I don't have a stake in this thing. I don't even have investments in the energy business. I own two stocks that I inherited from my dad, and I haven't sold them yet. So uh, I can't tell you how those guys do it, but I know how I do it, and I've been doing this a long time. I think I know what I'm doing, and um, – I can't explain it to you. Uh, the burden of proof, I guess, is on them, and we'll see if they're right. But I think they're wrong. I think they're dead wrong. All right. Well, it, I, if you can't talk about specific companies, just let me know. But I, I, I was shocked when I saw that Concho had bought RSP uh, for a land price of $79,000 an acre. Uh, so for the people listening, that, that, that means that, that for every acre – they had to pay seventy nine thousand dollars to gain access to that, which means that if, and I'm just rounding wildly here, and this is you know not even remotely appropriate, but let's say you could put a well every hundred acres because they have multiple benches and blah blah blah, it gets complex. But let's say hundred acres. That means the first seven point nine million dollars 
uh, went out the door before they even drilled a well, that means that these wells have to be just, just, just huge, enormous. How, how, how do I make sense of that particular deal or did that, did that catch your eyes? Oh yeah. Well, and it's not, it's, it's not the first one. It happens to be the, the most outrageous one. <laughs> I mean, you know, Permian, Permian uh, deals have been going for thirty, forty thousand dollars an acre for for well over a year. But I mean, it, it's a bubble, okay? And 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 so the psychology, as I see it, is this: that Concho happens to be a fairly good company. Um, they're one of the very few pure Permian players that actually makes more money, or I should say, made mm-hmm. more. Money. <laughs> uh, that's going to change. But but it's like it's like any other business, you know. You, you you get successful, and then you decide, well, you know, let's leverage up and 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 shoot for the moon. And and so that's what they've done. And what's their goal? Well, it's the goal of every oil and gas independent in the world, which is prove enough value, get bought, and be rich. Mm-hmm. That's what it's all about. So. Again, I have no insight into into Concho. I, you know, I have no vested interest in whether they succeed or fail. I've told you they're a pretty good company, so unless they screw it up, at least so far they've been good. But my guess is, is they're they're just, you know, they're they're betting big. They're betting everybody in the world wants to be in this play. If we can maximize our position and the perception of us as a really great company you know maybe chevron will come in and and pay way too much for us and you know what they're probably right or maybe exxon will that's that's the name of the game and it's not so it's it's not insane uh it could be wrong (laughs) but but you know it, it it'll probably work well, that that would be interesting, and I, I I get the game. Um, it's just from an analytical standpoint when I when I punch in the numbers of in terms of what's coming out of these wells. And this was uh, interesting at this last summit we had just down in Austin, which just happened this past weekend um, on May twentieth. Uh, there was a gentleman there who who, who uh, I was able to put a question to, which which was I I just love gathering more and more data. So our, you and I went back and forth. I found this piece that was written in oil and gas journals by Rystad, and they said. Wow, look, the break-even costs for Bakken wells have just plummeted, and that's a function of several components. But a big one is what you think the barrel of oil equivalents are that are coming out of a well. And they said, wow, look, they used to get 400,000 barrels out of a, of, of a well in the Bakken, and now they're getting 700,000. And of course, yeah, the, the economics get awesome when you've almost doubled your oil production per well. The problem is when I run over to Eno Peter's site and I look at the actual well data from... Uh, drilling info and you plot them out and you can just you don't have to be a genius to to see that these things are not going to yield anywhere not even close to 700,000 barrels Um, it's going to be closer to maybe 330 335 maybe 350 depending on the vintage and uh, that's it that's at a maximum so we had this conversation uh, by email, but but for for people out there, just help them understand um, what is going on here with these very very hugely dissimilar um, estimates out of how much oil is going to come out of a given well. I know you're you are uh, undisputably probably the expert at this. Yeah, so there's a there's a couple of ways to look at this, and the Bakken's a great example because uh, one of the uh, you know one of the classic accounting tricks is is in a play that has a lot of gas and it's how you convert the gas to what we call barrels of oil equivalent but in the Bakken that's you know there's not a lot of gas so you you know you don't have that that way of cheating your way around it so what happens is that uh you know and and by the way I mean I think Reistad is generally a pretty good outfit too so I'm not I'm not you know in any way criticizing them but but the, the easiest way to you know to estimate what wells are going to make the short way is to say well okay you know we know that wells drilled let's say in 2015 or 16 somebody like art has done the decline curve analysis and the average well you know for company x is going to make let's take your number say it's you know 300,000 barrels of oil okay so now what we do we don't have enough data on 2017 much less 2018 wells to be able to do that nobody does but what we can look at is the initial rates and we'll look at, you know, like the first five or six months of production because that's all we have. They say, oh, my God, you know, the initial rates are, you know, 
70% or 60% higher than they were in the last good year we could make an estimate on. So, you know, Artset or, you know, Netherlands Sewell or somebody said uh, that was 300,000 barrels. So we're going to say double it or, you know, almost double, it. let's say 500 or 550 or whatever. And so that's, you know, that that seems to be a reasonable way to do it, particularly if that initial rate isn't a very short rate. Okay, that, that, that was the way that the companies used to mislead people. They'd run a 24-hour test or a 72-hour test, and they'd extrapolate that out to infinity. But a rice stat is saying, no, no, we're prudent. We're looking at three months or six months, and, and, and you know, that's a stable number. Well, when you actually do the work, and you plot it out, what you find is, yeah, you can boost that initial couple of months rate by spending millions of dollars on a gigantic frack and drill, you know, two mile long laterals, but the decline rates are twice as steep. And you get out there, you know, maybe eight or nine months and you're already, the cumulative is already less than that really good year that Art or somebody else said was going to get you 300,000. So, so basically what you're doing is, is, you know, you're, you're putting the well on steroids and then it, you know, has a, has an apoplexy and it dies or, you know, or it, it becomes uh, like an old person. So that's the problem with that is, is you, you can't, you can't take a, an initial rate and assume that it's going to go on forever. Um, you know, I mean, if, 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 if I, if I thought that, you know, I was going to grow as big as I, you know, might be based on the first 10 years of my life growth rate, you know, I'd, I'd be 100 feet tall. <laughs> that ain't going to happen because that's not the way things work in the world. So that that's, you know, that's the best. And again, I'm not I'm not saying that they're lying or they're, you know, being misleading, but it, it's just a, it's a shortcut that people use. And they and they look at it and say, Oh, my God, these guys are just getting better and better. Well, the, the earth physics doesn't work that way. Interesting. Yeah, that the um, uh, the the gentleman who who came to to the Austin one was you know he he ran all of these calculations and he just basically said that um, uh, that in many cases what's happening is is uh, they're using um, calculations that were designed for conventional uh, reservoirs and they're applying them to these unconventional shale rock plays which have these hyperbolic decline curves and all the things that you do. But he he basically said he's seen it done over and over again even in his own industry where where people are using um, what's called an ARP. Um, calculation which is inappropriate and it just creates it, it assumes a big giant long tail that may not be there um, and what you're also noting is that when you actually do the work and you actually bother to to take a look at what's happening here yeah you get more at the beginning but it declines faster and that seems like an easy concept to get out there but boy there's a, um, a lot of people who are interested in that concept not getting out there how successful have you been in in you know bringing that detail to investors or to anybody who might really care? Uh, the choir standing behind me cheers every time. Uh, you know, the, the, the people that, that, that pay attention to data and that already kind of have a hint of the truth, they say that's great. But, uh, you know, let's be honest. The people, people want to believe a good story, especially if they've, they've heard it, you know, on uh, – uh, you know, Kramer, and they, they read it in the New York Times or the Wall Street Journal, and the president says so, and, you know, their congressman says so, and the president, CEO of an oil co- I mean, they, they want to believe that, you know, that, that things are getting better. And, and so um, to tell them that, in fact, they're not, they don't want to hear it. I mean, this is classic cognitive dissonance. And so uh, what, what, what happens, they'll say, well, you know, that's just Burma. You know, he's he's a he's a chronic skeptic and a kvetch and uh, anything he says, you know, he's already been proven wrong a thousand times. And, I, you know, I always ask people when they say that or, you know, tweet it, I say, can you be specific? What did I get wrong? <laughs> uh-huh. you know, they say, well, you said this. Say, can, can you tell me exactly where I said that? Because I don't remember ever saying that, but they don't care. OK, they you know, the same thing. They if they can find a reason to disbelieve what they don't want to believe, then then they will. Um, it's you know it's just the way people are, and and I'm not going to change that. Well, you say you're not an abnormal psychologist, but actually it would just be a normal psychologist because it's actually quite normal for people to um, you know tune out information that they don't want to hear because it conflicts with the belief system they hold. And and I've been um, you know over and over again 
I just released a video last week and people commenting under YouTube, which is really the YouTube comments quite often is, is an ignorant swap meet, you know, showing up at your doorstep, but it's, you know, there I am. And people are saying, Oh, aren't you the guy that was wrong about peak oil? You know, and I, and I just, I don't even know where to begin with that one. Cause I'm like, gosh, you know, how many individual, you know, fields or reservoirs would you like to look at? It's just, it's just a thing. It's not a, it's not a theory I have. It's just a thing. It's like, it's like saying, gravity exists, you know, but hey, there are people out there who are promoting the idea of a flat earth. So who knows? Um, so for people like us who really do like the data, though, are, uh, you know, where do you think we really are in terms of a um, possibly a, 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 a oil production peak in the United States? Well, the answer to that is how much capital is available to these sure. guys. Yeah. And of course, you know, that's that's painful for me to say because I'm a technical guy and, you know, I like to talk about production rates and EURs and reserves and economics and all that kind of, you know, detailed stuff. But, but the, the hard truth is that the reason we're producing, you know, 11 plus million barrels a day today is not because of technology and not because of efficiency. It's because of money. It's because there's a ton of capital in the world that is poured into U.S. exploration and production for a whole lot of reasons, none of which really have all that much to do with what a great business it is, except these guys can make a return, and it's usually a coupon kind of return. I won't get into the details. So, so if the money persists and it won't persist forever um, for a variety of reasons but yeah I mean you know we, we can we, we might we can easily get to 12 million a day um, but at some point and and I think you know there, there's always there's a fulcrum or, or, or a threshold and and you get to a you get to a point with oil price where people decide you know I'm I'm not going to drive as much because you know the cost at the pump is killing me and, and as soon as that happens, you know, as soon as, as demand uh, starts to feel the effects of higher price, well, you know, it takes a while to feed back through the system, but then price goes down. And when price starts going south, the investors go away. You know, they're, they're, they're looking to, you know, to buy low and sell high or buy high and sell higher. They're not looking to buy high and sell low. Right. And, and so once that happens, you know, the whole thing goes into into some sort of devaluation or deflation process and the game's over. Now, all of that assumes that we have business as usual and that the world economy and the U.S. economy is OK or more or less OK for you know some period of time. And, you know, you started this conversation uh, talking about, you know, the the absolutely unmanageable levels of debt that 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 world governments and consumers and corporations have. I mean, you know, at some point, uh, the world economy is not only going to grow slowly; it's going to stop growing. And when that happens, the game, at the very least, changes radically. If not, is kind of over. So, business as usual, two uh, or three percent growth per year. Uh, as long as oil price doesn't get too high to cause demand to pull back, which it already is in my book, uh, good, good on you. But, um, you know, there, there are feedback loops and, and we're, we're, we're way beyond, um, you know, what I think is the sensitivity of the American consumer to, to high oil price right now. So a large part of the growth in the U.S. economy over the last year was a lag effect from very low energy prices. Um, now that's changed. How long will it take before that feeds back through the system and we see, you know, a, a movement the other way? Can't say, but it'll happen. Well, with the recent, uh, the Federal Reserve, you know, in its inimitable wisdom, suddenly discovering that that half of all households roughly can't afford 400 bucks, um, you know, it, it doesn't take much of a gas price hike to, to really crimp uh, the average family out there, of course. And so, uh, but I am noticing, you know, even the wall street journal, just a, a few weeks ago, uh, dug into the shale space and noted, and I love how they phrase this. I'm, I'm doing this from memory, but it, it was close. This is that they said the shale industry is in the last 10 years has spent $280 billion more than it's earned from operations. Um, 
I like to shorten that sentence up. I call that losses. Uh, the Wall Street Journal couldn't quite bring itself to call them losses at this stage. But that's a huge number. So, Art, here's a question. Do you have any sense, like, like you know, so the, the, we get this sense that they're on this treadmill, these shale companies, and they, they have to spend money. And, of course, you know, you want to keep your production up. And, and they're just throwing all the drill rigs are going like crazy and frack crews are out there. So all that's happening. But what if you took one of these companies that, that was, you know, if you took the average industry and said, stop, no more money, you can't, that's it, we're just going to, you know, run right out, we're just going to take all the stuff that you're producing and just, like, basically turn off this this Red Queen drill program they've got going, could they pay back that $280 billion, uh, at this point in time from, from, from existing wells? Absolutely not, Chris. I, I mean, I, I do these calculations, you know, every quarter. And, and, and economists and, you know, all, all these people that are much more sophisticated than I am about, you know, about finance, they'll tell you or they'll tell me and say, oh, you know, uh, cash flow, uh, you know, to uh, over, over capital expenditures, that, 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 that's not the way we do it. We look at net income. And, and so there's, you know, there's a million caveats as to how we can show that even though they're spending more than they're making, you know, some sophisticated analysts can say, but they made a profit. And, and I say, no, guys, I mean, you know, I'm simplistic. But the, the other calculation I do is I take their total debt, whatever it is, and I divide it by their cash from operations. And you can't argue with that. Okay? Right. <laughs> you know? and, and, and what I find is that of all the companies that are in this, you know, tight oil space, if that's the right word, that there are none of them that could pay off their debt in less than two years. And I'm talking about spending absolutely nothing on anything, including salaries, including right. keeping the lights on, just taking all the money from the well and putting it into debt, putting it into, into debt service. And most of those companies, that ratio is four to one or four years. And there are, there are companies, a lot of them, that get up to 8, 10, 12 years. So, so none of those things are ever going to happen. I mean, that's like saying if I took all of my income, you know, every penny that I get in a paycheck, and, and, and solely used it to pay off my mortgage, you know, how long would it take before I paid the mortgage off? Well, it'd be an awful long time. So, no, there, there, there's no realistic way that that's going to happen. And that's, you know, that's like a, a physics experiment. If, if we assume there's no friction, <laughs> you know, big <laughs> assumption. Um, and, 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 of course, the other piece of that is, well, if you stop growing production um, and you stop showing any kind of cash flow, what happens to your stock price? Well, you know, everybody runs away from it and, and you go bankrupt. I mean, you, you know, you, you, you don't have any, you, you got no investors and, and all the executives whose, whose compensation is based on stock options, they're out the door looking for another job. So, you know, the reality is there is friction, there is gravity, that's not going to happen. But even in a perfect world, you're talking years and years and years to ever get back to, you know, to some sort of sanity. And, and that part, you know, and, and even that, let me put some color on that. So the idea that, um, uh, to continue this metaphor. So let's say, you know, you said you had to pay your mortgage off right away. How long would it take? But your income would be declining yes. uh, very rapidly. So if we said, wow, th this company could pay back uh, its debts in four years, but if its wells full stop, you know, have declined by an average of, I don't know, across the whole mess of them, 50% in that period of time, that four years turns into a much longer period of time, right? So so that was my question is like, if given their current run rate, if you just said stop, now you have to just take all the money you've spent and give it back in terms of debt and I hope also equity, some returns. But what we're saying is just the debt alone, there's no possible way if you just took these companies and turned them into just a, um, a residual, you know, glide path, take this down to zero. There's no way they could just stop and have this work out. No. And, 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 the, and the, the bigger picture, Chris, is that, I mean, the, the, the base decline rate. So if you took, you know, the Bakken, or the Eagleford, and and you just stop drilling any new wells. Just you know, just you got you know what you got ten or twelve thousand wells or more. You know, in the Bakken, I think you've got you know close to fifteen thousand, and the Eagleford maybe twelve. So you got you know a gazillion wells that are producing, and you just said, okay, we're not drilling any new wells. 
those entire fields would decline 30% a year, 30%. Now, it doesn't mean that, you know, a new well is going to decline at 30%, but the, you know, the base production, the field itself is, I mean, basically in three and a half years, it's producing nothing. Wow. Wow. I mean, that's, that's sobering. Okay. That's, and, and, and that's the part of, of the shale story that we don't want to think about. And that is that the decline rates are four or five times higher than a conventional well. And we kind of all know that and we even acknowledge it, but you know, we, we don't really feel it because they're drilling so many wells all the time. I mean, the Bakken's got 60 rigs working in it right now. Here's a play that I'm telling you is, you know, is not going to grow anymore. And yet there are 60 drill rigs running all the time in that play. And so there's always new wells. And I showed a graph and I, you know, just recently the North Dakota agency that reports on production, uh, they release their data every month. And the, there's a record number of wells in the Bakken. And yet every month the production declines. And, and today production is 5% less than it was in December 2014, which was the peak, and there are 4,000 wells more now than there were then. That's that. There's a really good measure wow. of you know of of what that decline rate looks like. You've got to drill. You've got to have a quarter more, 4,000 wells more than you did three and a half years ago, and you still can't get to the same level of output. And Art, let's talk about just a single one of those wells, because for people who haven't been on site, so in the Bakken, I assume, you know, they're drilling down about 10,000 feet, and then they tip it sideways, maybe another, you said two miles, we'll call it 10,000 feet, you know, sideways, and then they have to frack it. What What's it like to be on site for a frack job? It's a spectacle. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I mean, it's, 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 uh, it's, it, you know, it's like one of the best episodes of Game of Thrones you've ever seen. I mean, there are, you know, there are hordes of white walkers and, you know, there's thousands, <laughs> there's thousands of people and there's thousands of trucks. And I mean, my God, the noise is unbelievable. And, you know, nobody can drive on country roads because there's so many trucks hauling sand and hauling water. I mean, it is to call it an industrial scale operation is to miss the point. I mean, it is epic. It's absolutely massive. That's one well, one well. One well, I've, I've, I've heard, um, you know, uh, more than a thousand truckloads, uh, particularly on these big ones where they're pushing millions of pounds of sand and equivalent gallons of water down that hole. And so just think about how do you get a million pounds of sand on site? Just 1 million pounds. Well, I don't know if there are 50,000 pounds in a truck, that's a lot of trucks you got to drive, you know? And, and and each truck has got to drive that sand from wherever they pick it up to wherever they deliver it. And they're using diesel to run the trucks. And, you know, you start you start accumulating all this energy that's that's being expended for the purpose of the frack. And and it's pretty considerable. Now, you know, I'm not I'm not saying that it's wrong to frack. I mean, we can have that argument, you know, another time. And I do have. I do have strong feelings about that, but you know, on the assumption that that there's no there's no harm done to the environment, mm -hmm. um, that it's all good because it keeps all these guys driving trucks, you know, earning money and everything like that. It is just, I mean, you just can't hardly believe it. You know, I mean, I go out to a, a location that you know that I had something to do with with you know getting it drilled. I made the maps. I said drill here. And, I, you know, 40 years I've been doing this business and it never fails to not only astonish me, but kind of scare the crap out of me. I go out there and I say, look at all this stuff. You know, I mean, I I did this. That's kind of scary. Yeah. You know, there's trailers and guys and equipment and, you know, big noises. I mean, it, it's expensive. So. Again, I'm not saying it's good or bad. I'm just saying it is a big, big operation. Yeah, just just huge. And and of course, I think that gets lost in this idea of like thousands of wells. You know, we need four thousand more wells just sort of hold production steady. You know, ish in in the Bakken. And and so this is really it's just a massive industrial scale thing. And this is what people need to understand. This is, I mean, you put it best years ago. This is a retirement party. Here we are blasting basically chalkboard level slate 
you know, into pieces in order to get the last few remnants of, of oily goodness out. And and it's it's such a mystery to me that you could have a company like Ford saying, wow, we'll just depend on that for the rest of our corporate careers here. That that should work out fine, you know, uh, for the next hundred years. It's just it's just such a mystery. So in the last few minutes we have left, I know I didn't leave nearly enough time for this, but I was really caught by the idea that the United States is pressuring Germany to ditch the Nord Stream 2 gas pipeline, which is going to come from Russia under the Baltic Sea and and um, and put gas into Germany. And and the United and the Germans have said the the United States is pretty clear they want us to use their LNG exports. Art, uh, please quickly for our people. Um, <laughs> can the United States ever be a, a world class uh, LNG exporter? And I did the numbers real quick. They would get eighteen the equivalent of eighteen billion cubic feet per day out of the Nord Stream two. Um, once you factor in the losses from turning a gas to a liquid, that would be the equivalent of the United States exporting, I think, somewhere, let's call it 22, 23 billion cubic feet of natural gas a day. Could we do that? No. That's I mean, it? Our, <laughs> no, just a simple no. I mean, I know I'm being very black and white today, Chris, and, and, and I'm usually much more, you know, gray than that. But you know, when you put it that way, no. I mean, the, the U.S. produces something like, you know, 75 to 80 billion cubic feet of gas a day and so when you start talking about well what if you guys just took a third of that and and sent it to germany well you know that that had pushed the price of natural gas to 10 or 15 dollars a thousand cubic feet because we'd suddenly have this gigantic deficit and as soon as you're getting 10 or 15 dollars per unit in the u.s well why send it to germany why go through all the you know, the trouble of all that liquefaction and forget about the fact you got, you know, it's going to cost you at least $2 per unit to get it from, you know, wherever it leaves the U.S. to wherever it lands in, in Germany and it's got to be regasified over there and that's a cost. No, it's, 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 a, it's a totally, uh, that scale is just plain dumb and, and is never going to happen. But the scale that we are talking about, which is, you know, Two and a half, three BCF a day is what it is right now of of net exports. Okay, so you take everything we import, everything we export. We're exporting more, and we're, we're a net exporter of natural gas for the first time in our history. Well, already, you know, the 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 analysts and 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 the, and the commodity traders, they just look at production, and if you look at production and you add or subtract, you add net net imports to it, which in this case is a subtraction, you look at the, the actual available supply and that supply in the United States, I'm just using EIA forecasts, we're going to peak in August of this year, a couple of months. Production keeps on going for a while, but the available supply because of the increasing exports, forget Germany, forget 20 BCF a day, just the natural state of affairs right now, we're going to be back in a deficit in no time at all, you know, a year, maybe a year and a half. And so uh, I, I've never understood, absolutely never understood the economics uh, of LNG. But, um, you know, again, we're, we're into the world of either normal or abnormal psychology. The answer is, is that people have bet their, their professions and their investments on these things. And as long as the United States increased production 7 BCF a day, as we did in 2017, they say, see, with technology, all things are possible. Mm -hmm. So did it seven, we can get to 22, no problem, except that we can't. And, and, and so, you know, just to, to leave this where it needs to be, a quarter of U.S. gas production today comes from the Marcellus, from one play. Quarter. I mean, that's huge. Uh, and, and that field is going to peak and then it's going to decline like all other things on earth including me and you you know we grow mm -hmm. and then we don't grow and then we get old and we die the marcellus is going to peak in the next couple of years where are we going to go to replace the marcellus and the answer is nowhere right. oh well there's all this associated gas from the permian blah 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 you know, there's always a new narrative to, to pick up where the, the cracks form in the last one. But at some point, you know, all the narratives are played out and then everybody flips around and says, oh, well, you know, now we're in the LNG import business again. We've done that, you know, several times in our history. So, no, I, I think I think the whole proposition of supplying the world with natural gas 
is is completely phony uh, or or delusional. I don't know which it is. <laughs> All right. Well, Art, very well said. I'm going to leave it there for today. We've been talking with Art Berman. Uh, just always a pleasure, Art. And of course, his website is artberman.com. And you can follow him at Twitter at aeberman1212. So that with that, Art, thank you so much for your time today. Thanks, Chris. Always a pleasure.